Welcome to the third seminar of Open Science course. As you know by now, this is a joint event with Reproducibility Unibasal Journal Club. Today, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Mine Chetinkaya Rundel. Uh, she is an associate professor of practice uh, in the Department of Statistical Science at Duke University and a data scientist and professional educator at our studio. Her work focuses on the innovation in statistics and data science pedagogy with an emphasis on informatics, reproducible research, student-centered learning, and open source education. Among other things, uh, she is also the creator and maintainer of datasciencebox.org and teacher the popular massive open online course Statistics with R on Coursera. So without further ado, please welcome Mina. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. Uh, this seems like a really fun group to talk to. So I hope you'll enjoy the talk. Um, the talk will be a mix of some slides and I'll try to do a little bit of a live demo. Um, I haven't set it up so that you can necessarily like type the code along with the live demo. So I encourage you to watch it, particularly because it's being recorded anyway. But by the end of the talk, we're going to push everything to a GitHub repository. So should you decide to go back and you know try out the code yourself, you'll have an artifact that you can go back to. So I would just enjoy the talk uh, for this hour. And then um, if you're interested in interacting with the code, you'll have an opportunity to do so later. And I'll share that link with you at the end of the talk. So let me go ahead and uh, start the presentation here. And share my screen. If you're interested in the slides themselves, you can find them at the short link at the bottom that is bit.ly slash improve refer workflow. And I'll flash that link to you at the end of the talk as well. So um, the talk is titled Improve Your Workflow for Reproducible Science. And I don't know if you recognize this color scheme, but if you are familiar with this painting. It's actually a distorted version of that color scheme. And generally the screaming figure in the context of reproducibility says something like the results in table one don't seem to correspond to those in figure two to me, because that to me is kind of the bane of my existence, but something that happens. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we can maybe try to avoid that sort of situation um, by following reproducible reproducibility principles and reproducible workflows. I'm going to flash a few numbers to you, just a set of random numbers um, that I've generated in R, except I have generated these number, uh, random numbers by setting a seed first. And what that means is that if you were to run my code for generating the random numbers, but set the same seed, you should be able to get the same numbers as, uh, as well. So that's like a very, very mini tip for reproducibility that if you have any sort of random sampling or generation in your work, you might want to set a seed. But let's take a look at a few other numbers. So 70, um, turns out that more than 70% of um, researchers who were interviewed or surveyed as part of this um, study on reproducibility said they have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments. But I can imagine it's difficult to reproduce other people's work maybe, um, although science kind of says you should be able to do that, um, but 50, is the percent of those same researchers who said they've tried and failed to reproduce their own experiments. Now, in this case, we're talking about reproducing an experiment. So this study wasn't just about computational reproducibility, um, but still these numbers are pretty painstakingly high. And 1,070 is the number of Google Scholar yields. Uh, if you search for the term or uh, phrase reproducibility crisis, just in 2021. So I actually did this search last night. Um, that's a high number. Then again, the word crisis is a little bit sensational. Um, so, and we kind of tend to know that if you write like a sensational paper, it's more likely to get published maybe, but still that's a high number. And this number is something I've been tracking for years now and it's always high and it's going higher and higher. So this reproducibility crisis, even though we are aware of it, um, it seems like we haven't really been able to do something about it yet. Um, and 1992 is the earliest reference that I was able to find, at least to reproducibility research. 
um, that's a pretty long time to be researching a topic and still not having like a stellar answer to how to get things uh, right, maybe. So I'm going to show you this paper from 1992. Um, the title is Electronic Documents Give Reproducible Research a New Meaning. And I want to show you a few excerpts from that. So one of them, it, said that it says that in 1990, we set this sequence of goals, learn how to merge a publication with its underlying computational analysis, teach researchers how to prepare a document in a form where they themselves can reproduce their own research results a year or more later by pressing a single button, learn how to leave finished work in a condition where coworkers can reproduce the calculation, including the final illustration by pressing a button in its calculation, so on uh, in, it, uh, in its caption, so on and so forth. Some of this is basically what I'm talking about today. We're in year 2021 and we're still kind of trying to educate folks on how to achieve these things. Part of that is technological. The tools are becoming easier and easier to use in this domain. There are many, many more of them, but some of the things um, are still you know, not that easy to do. So another one, another funny bit perhaps um, um, here is it says, now that we've begun using CD-ROM publication and we're well beyond that now, they're saying we can go much further. Every figure caption contains a push button that just jumps to the appropriate science directory or folder and initiates a figure rebuild command, then displays the figure possibly as a movie or interactive program. How many of you have read a paper where you were able to do this? I'm going to guess not many of us have been able to. So um, this is the goal set forth in 1990. And I thought, you know, CD-ROM publication was going to be the door opener to being able to achieve this. And we're kind of not really there. And maybe some of that is how journals are structured and the platforms that they give us for publication. But there are a variety of things at play here. And I have to admit, some of it is on us as researchers for not necessarily following reproducible workflows. Um, so this is a study from uh, February 2019, which I believe was the first published article in a journal that actually has this live code thing that was being discussed in the 1990 paper. That is, this is a uh, journal publication that is interactive. So you can see one of the figures there and you can see the blue um, kind of dot in the middle of the screen that says R script next to it. And if you actually click on it, uh, you can run the code and reproduce this figure. So we know of publications where there's a PDF that exists and then code is supplemented say on a GitHub repository, which is great, but wouldn't it be nice if this is kind of how we think of publications where everything is really embedded in to the publication itself. So before we talk about some ways that can get us closer to this ideal goal, um, I want to set the stage a little bit. So what do I mean when I talk when I uh, say reproducibility? There's actually two terms that get confused a little bit, and I want to make sure that we define things properly. Um, and at least this is my definition of them. So when we say uh, reproducibility versus replicability, we are talking about trying to answer the same research question. We are talking about trying to get the same results. We are, however, in the context of replicability, maybe you have new data you're working with versus in the context of computational reproducibility, the idea is that you have the same data. So it almost feels like the computational reproducibility should be easier because it's same everything. Why shouldn't you be able to get the same results? but turns out you need to do a lot of things to make sure that happens. So that is the reproducibility that I will be talking about. If you're interested in reading about replicability, I recommend, highly recommend um, the ASA statement on p-values. Um, it is brief, um, but it is a nice read and it has lots of nice citations um, to work um, in this area. So what do I mean by computational reproducibility? Um, let's imagine that you have in your paper a uh, regression output, right? So I'm going to give an example using this Palmer Penguins data set, which has information on kind of body measurements and uh, of uh, a group of penguins. Um, and um, we are trying to predict bill depth from uh, flipper length. So basically the depth of their beaks uh, from their flipper length. And this is our 
regression table that we might include in our publication. Uh, so I have included this. And then further down, um, I have a, a figure representing the same relationship. So bill depth on the, um, we have bill depth and flipper length on the spot as well. Actually, the um, axis should be reversed here. But what is a mismatch here is that my plot has a positive slope, but my table has a negative slope. How did that happen? Am I just being sloppy? Um, yeah, in a way, maybe I was being sloppy, but in reality, the way this sort of really, um, you know, innocent error occurs is that chances are you're writing your report and then you do a little bit of your analysis, you fit a model, and then maybe you copy and paste your results into your report. Then you do a bit more writing. I mean, imagine pages and pages of writing where these things are not even on the same page anymore. And then you decide, oh, I want to visualize the relationship. Um, and when you get to that, maybe you realize, hey, one of those species, the Gen 2 penguins, looks so different from the others that I think I'm going to omit that from my analysis. So then what you do is you say, all right, let me omit them from my analysis, maybe give some narrative around that, and then let me go ahead and um, plot my relationship one more time. Well, when that happened, the uh, sign of the relationship changed when we dropped the, that group of penguins. But because you have this copy paste approach, your table one did not get updated. Um, and that's how you basically end up with this sort of mismatch. Um, you know, hopefully you catch this sort of thing um, at the time of edits, but it's also possible not to. So we really want to think about ways of developing this sort of analysis writing where it doesn't count on you as the human to have to remember to go back and make fixes that all of this stuff happens automatically. So how do we go about uh, trying to avoid this sort of mishap? Um, we want to uh, make our raw data available. We want to make our code and documentation to reproduce the analysis available. And we want to also make the specifications of our computational environment available. Being able to achieve these three will bring us closer to kind of reproducible open science. Um, I have a quote here from Keith Baggerly, who works on reproducibility problems, among other things. Um, and the quote says, the most important tool is the mindset when starting that the end product will be reproducible. Um, so what do we mean by that? Uh, what we really mean is that we need to start thinking about a reproducible framework as opposed to trying to make our work reproducible at the end of our project. So if this is the reproducibility um, spectrum, where on one hand we have nobody, not even yourself, can recreate any part of your analysis, and on the other hand, you basically have that gold standard push button reproducibility in your published work, this is obviously what you want to aim for. But the goal um, that I want to kind of communicate today is that maybe just try to get close to it. It's okay if you don't achieve that push button reproducibility sort of thing, but don't let that stop you from trying to get closer to that. So I'll talk about a few approaches today and think about where you are on that spectrum and think about with my next project, how can I make maybe one more step closer to that ideal goal? Um, and the thing is, there is no one size fits all solution for computational reproducibility. So I don't really have, you know, some uh, big secret to reveal here that's going to work for, uh, you know, everyone, not even everyone on this call, probably, but the following things might help. So I'm going to talk about eight principles here that I think might help in some way. Um, the first is that you want to organize your project. So what do I mean by that? If on one end of the spectrum, this is what your organization looks like. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have like perfect Marie Kondo level organization. We want to get somewhere close to that organization level. Um, that means that each project should be in its own folder and no analysis should be reaching outside of that folder into another project. So think about encapsulating your projects in a folder and within that, you want to make sure that you have a consistent naming structure for what various steps of your project is. So if you have a pretty simple analysis, 
What you might have is a folder called raw data. Think of that as the holy land. You don't get to touch any of that data. You don't get to open any of that data in anything like Excel. Um, you simply read that data in from that raw data folder into your manuscript that R RMD, which is your R markdown file, which allows you to bring together your um, code and your prose in one document. And if you have interim steps for your data that you don't want to have to repeat every time you're re running your analysis, maybe you do a little bit of data cleaning in a separate um, script and place the process data into that process data folder. And maybe your manuscript simply reads data from the process data folder. Um, what this means is if you share this folder with somebody else, they'll know exactly what things are. They won't have to email you back and say things like, where is the version of the data set you actually used for your analysis? Now, for a simpler analysis, this sort of organization might work. But what if your analysis is a bit more complex? Um, then maybe you have things like, in addition to raw and process data, a set of scripts that are in a particular order that need to be ran. Maybe those script, scripts even generate some figures that are computationally intensive to regenerate. And then again, your manuscript lives in an R Markdown document and pulls in some of those figures. Um, importantly, you want to stick to the convention of your peers. That's maybe your lab mate, or maybe that is your, um, you know, your discipline. Um, and whatever convention works for them is the useful one to um, use as well. This means if you're working in a research group, you should have this sort of conversation to say, how are we organizing our projects? Number two, write read me liberally. Um, so what do I mean by that? Say if in your raw data folder, you have a bunch of CSV files, even if they are what might seem like um, kind of reasonably named and one would be able to, you know, tell looking at these, one of the files contains information on airlines, another one on airports, add a readme in there. In that readme, actually describe where the data came from. Um, if you downloaded it from somewhere, on which date did you download it? How did you do that? And also make sure that you include some information about each of the data files. So the um, kind of the um, first reaction of somebody landing in this folder isn't to open one of the files, but to open the readme and get all the information that they might need without having to open the files. Uh, number three, keep your data tidy and machine readable. Um, so let's think about this one example. This is the sort of example I deal with a lot in my life because um, I, you know, teach. And so I maintain a lot of course ro rosters where I have to record student information. And so let's imagine these are a group of students in the classroom. We have their names, their exam grades, and what majors they were in. And then in this case, we have used color to identify, um, you know, participation level, which for a human um, might be helpful. You know, when you land in that uh, uh, in that spreadsheet, maybe that's the first thing you want to see as quickly as possible. But this is not machine readable, really, at least not easily. So the goal would be to go from um, this kind of not machine readable, non-tidy data set to storing your data as tidy as possible. And when you're doing this conversion, um, make sure that you record the code that you use to do the conversion. And if you had to do anything that is non-code related, um, so you had to maybe manually enter some things. In this case, I had to manually enter the participation column. I'd put a readme in this folder where the raw data lives and actually document what I wrote. And also write some tests when you do this. You know, if you had a certain number of students in the input data, you wanna make sure when you, uh, tidy up the data, you have the same number of students. But we've done a bunch of things here. We've gotten rid of merged cells, we've gotten rid of color to indicate a variable and instead added that as a variable. We had a list column of majors where some people had multiple entries and some people had single. We divided that up into two columns. There were many ways NAs were represented like missed exams, sick or just a dot we've converted all of those to NAs. So all of this means that now when I wanna work with this data, I can load this into something like R a lot more easily. Um, if you're interested, 
uh, in learning more about how to organize data in spreadsheets to allow for reproducibility. And this might be for you as the analyst, or if you tend to collaborate with others who provide data for you, who are one of those people who love to like color rows of Excel uh, spreadsheets to indicate something important. I highly recommend this paper that's cited at the bottom, uh, Data Organization and Spreadsheets by Carl Broman and Kara Wu. Um, um, and it's also a paper you may want to share with collaborators as well. Uh, number four, you want to comment your code as much as possible. But when I say comment your code, more so than commenting what is happening. So in this case, for example, we have fit a smooth uh, curve to the relationship between the flipper length and bill length of um, these uh, penguins. Um, and you can see that I do have a comment at the top of my code that says use lowest smoothing but I probably could have gleaned that from my analysis to begin with, you know, in my geom smooth layer, I'm already seeing the word LOAS. The more important thing to comment here would have been this number that is clearly manually determined that, you know, tells us that's the span of the smoother. So that tells us how smooth the line you're fitting is. Um, that's the sort of thing you also want to be commenting as well. So your code comments are not just about what you're doing in the code, but also why you're doing it. Why did you pick that number as opposed to a smaller or a larger number? This is also similar if you're doing, for example, a Bayesian analysis and you have to set some priors or hyper priors. What values do you choose for them and how did you come up with them? Don't assume that you're going to remember them and don't assume that people are going to be able to figure it out when they read your code. Uh, number five is use literate programming. So what do I mean by literate programming? I mean a document like this, where we have basically, you can see our code, uh, those are the more grayed out bits and our, um, and our um, prose, uh, the actual text, everything in one document. And what happens is that we basically create this uh, kind of computational document that uses literate programming. And ultimately we want to be able to click knit and then get the output in whatever format we want. In this case, it's an HTML output, but we could write it out to a PDF or a Word. So what I want to do right now is to step away from the slides for a second. So I'll share my full screen with you and kind of walk you through a few things that you can do in an R Markdown document to help with your reproducibility. So let me stop sharing this and start sharing my desktop. And um, I am going to be using an R Markdown document and using it in our studio. And one of the things that I'm going to do is actually start using the visual editor for um, the R Markdown editor. Uh, this is a new feature in the R Studio IDE. And I think it's a really, really useful feature. It makes it seem like you're kind of starting to write your code in something that looks more like a Google Doc as opposed to um, uh, kind of a source code file, uh, which I find the experience a lot more kind of uh, pleasant. And you know, you can do things like um, bold your text or italicize and stuff like that. Everything that you can do kind of in um, WYSIWYG um, text editor as well. But I want to highlight some of its functionalities uh, with respect to kind of uh, doing reproducible authoring. And in order to do that, I'm going to refer to my notes, but man, Zoom is such a sticky. Sorry. <laughs> it's like always hard to get rid of these Zoom controls when you need them out of the way. Okay, so here we have this R Markdown document. What we have on top of the R Markdown document is what we call a YAML, which indicates um, you know, some metadata about this. Our code is in what we call code chunks. And then we also have our prose, so our text in here as well. So let's go ahead and knit this document. And I am going to knit it so that we can show you the output to start with. Uh, one of the big reproducibility tips I'll give you is that if anybody gives you an R Markdown document, the first thing you should do before um, doing anything with it is to knit it so that you can make sure that it's actually working without any, issue, without any issues. And so this is what the result of that uh, document looks like. You can see that we have the code, 
but we also now have the process output. I didn't have to do anything like copy and paste figures into my document. I can simply uh, kind of access them all in one place in this one output. My code is being processed when I need it. So what are some features uh, that are kind of nice to have? So the first thing is uh, perhaps working with um, um, citations, okay? So the first thing that I'm going to show is maybe we want to say something like the data uh, come from, and then I'm going to insert a citation here. Um, well, we can go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and um, actually open this menu and look for a citation. And a nice thing that you can do is you can actually uh, grab things from like a Zotero library or something like that. But I know I have taken a note of the, um, the DOI of the paper where the data comes from. So you can actually uh, paste a DOI to search and then you can decide, um, do you want this to be in-text citation? Yes, and I'm simply going to insert that. And we can see that a citation has been added. Um, we can see that my metadata on top has changed to say that I have a bib file for my references. And if I knit this document now, I'll be able to see that the citation appears in my resulting document and also the reference is included at the bottom of my document as well. Oops, come on, you can do it. All right, here we go. So the citation basically appears here and at the bottom of my document, I can see my reference. Maybe something I'd like to do here is to say, uh, maybe insert a heading that says references so that that's neatly separated from my uh, plot. Another thing that I might want to do is to add some inline code. So um, here I have hard coded things like how many species uh, I'm discussing in my um, data analysis, what the names of those species are. But this is the sort of thing when you have this stuff hard coded into your text, you may later want to change them and it can become quite difficult to catch everywhere that they appear in your document. So what we might want to do is to think about what, what would be a way to kind of get this number three, the number of species that um, is in the data set. So I am going to say, I'm going to insert, insert an inline uh, code. So let's do the insert menu. So raw inline, oh no, sorry. So let's add the R code for kind of figuring out what the number of species is. And now this is formatted as code, but if we were to knit our document, we'll be able to see that that R code is actually being um, kind of process and it's looking to see how many unique species there are in um, kind of the, the penguins data set and that's going to result in the number three uh, that's included in your text uh, simply as the number three and the styling of that is the same as the text around it. So let's take a look at our text. So now this is no longer a hard-coded number. So if I actually change um, you know what um, what what's in my uh, input data set, I will be able to see that pretty easily here in my um, chain, have the change reflected in my document as well. Um, another thing that's helpful is, um, you know, another thing that might be helpful when you're making a document with figures like this perhaps is to be able to collapse those figures into something a little bit more compact. So I want to um, kind of show you one of those as well. So in this particular um, code chunk, we're creating three different figures. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them some names as opposed to printing them out. Let's call them P1, P2, and P3. And then I'm going to use functionality from the patchwork package to actually combine these into a visually appealing uh, figure. So maybe we want to do something like um, put the first two figures on the same line and then maybe put the last figure um, on the next line. And then actually you can do some other neat things with this package. I am going to cheat a bit here. Um, and 
for, with code that I had prepared ahead of time, but we can actually create annotations at the figure level. So we can label our figures, you know, uh, A, B, C, give it an overall title, a subtitle, a caption, so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and knit this document to see what the result of that is. Something is slow with my computer. Oh, well. Wow. So you can kind of see that now all of those um, are kind of combined together. We have the first two figures on uh, plots on top and the other one in the bottom. And we can see that the guide, the legend has been collected and where there's only a single legend as opposed to one for each one of them. Um, another thing is this figure looks, you know, terribly squished. So we can take advantage of the fact that we can define our figure sizing um, um, based on uh, option, uh, options in our R chunk. So maybe I'll use a different aspect ratio and make it a little bit uh, bigger as well to make it look a little nicer in my paper. And then another thing is, chances are you don't want all this code in your resulting analysis, especially if this is like a paper submission, right? We're probably not going to want to see all this code in our output, but we certainly do not want to remove it from our input document because that's where the reproducibility happens. So I can actually add a global option to my doc document and say, do not echo any of the code chunks, meaning don't show the code to me. So when I knit this, all of the code is going to be hidden, but all of the output will be present. But say you then share this with a collaborator or you submit it to a journal and you get some feedback on it, um, they're going to give you feedback on the resulting document without the code, but you can go back and recreate all of your analysis based on your R Markdown file. So now we've basically gotten rid of all of the um, code here as well. So that's a mini demo of the things that you can achieve. Um, and so I am going to now go back to um, my slides quickly. Go. Now we'll have one more mini demo. So if you want to learn more about our markdown, I've given you uh, links to uh, some useful resources here, and I'll share the uh, link to my slides at the end of the talk uh, so that you can go ahead and grab these as well. And there's a link to how to use the visual editor as well, which I find a lot more kind of nicer to use, especially that citation entry thing is a lifesaver. Um, the next uh, principle is using version control. So what do we mean by using version control? We're writing our document using plain text in this computational document. We wanna make sure that our changes are tracked by Git, and then we can host our document on something like GitHub. And if you're able to publicly host your document on something like GitHub, now you have basically not only work that is reproducible, but that is open as well. Um, there are two workflows that you might use when working uh, with GitHub, either the GitHub first workflow or the local first workflow. I tend to use the GitHub first workflow where if today I'm starting a new project, I'll do the right thing and create a repository on GitHub first, and then I can copy the repo URL, clone it in our studio, make any changes and commit and push to GitHub. And then we can confirm that our changes have propagated to GitHub. But that's not what we did today, right? We did the other approach, which was local first. And if you're not a version control user um, prior to today, but today you decide the next project I'm working on or the project I'm currently working on, I actually want to check into version control, you might be in this boat. I've been working on a project for a while. And now I'm realizing that I should have been tracking it with Git. So then what we do is we want to make sure that you are in what we call an RStudio project. Um, and then we can use handy functions from the use this package to start version control and then start using GitHub as well. And then from there onwards, we can follow the instructions. So let's go ahead and demo this real quick too. So let me go ahead and stop sharing one more time the keynote and then go back to my desktop. Okay. So what we're going to do is for a brief moment, I am going to take 
this um, file out of here and place it on my, my desktop. That's right. Sorry, I think it's having difficulty because I was presenting from it. Okay, so we've taken the keynote file out. I just didn't want to try to check in this giant keynote file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the use this package to say, let's start using Git, okay? And what it tells me is, uh, it asks me, is it okay to commit all of these uncommitted files? And I say, yes. So this is an instance where you can check, do I have anything private in here that I don't want going on a public repository? And if you say, sure, it's okay to do that. Let's add our selection. Um, and then it says that we need a restart of our studio. Are you okay with doing that? And I'll say, yeah, I'm okay with doing that as well. So it will actually do that for me and restart the R Studio session for me. The next thing is now this is a version controlled project. So I can see that I now have a Git pane. Um, White again. I now have a Git pane, although nothing is pending here. So the next thing that I might want to do is I might want to say, let's create a GitHub repository as well. So now I'm going to say use GitHub. And what this will do is because I have my credentials stored, um, it will create a GitHub repository based on this particular folder. So everything that I have committed is now going to a GitHub repository that has been created for me with the commit called initial commit. So now everything that I, uh, you know, intended to have in this repository is in this public GitHub repository. So what I'm going to do is I will uh, copy the link to this and place it in the chat in case you want to kind of follow along to see what happens. Um, and let's do a couple of things here. The first thing I'm going to show you is, what if there's some stuff that you don't want to put in your GitHub repository? Well, if you never want them in there, uh, then they should have never been in this folder in the first place, right? Because that approach of use Git actually committed everything. But I have here a folder file called notes.md, which is notes I took for myself so I can paste myself during this talk. Maybe that's just like my personal thing. I don't want to share with everybody. So I can open my git ignore file and say, I don't want notes.md to be in there anymore. Okay, let's go ahead and refresh this. So now I have, um, I'm going to basically remove that file from this folder for a second. I'll put it in my desktop. And what I'm going to have here is a commit that says, um, remove notes and let's go ahead and push that and what we can see in our repository is that we now have a new commit that um, has removed the notes from there and that notes.md is no longer there so even if I was to bring that file back now Even if I was to bring that file back into my um, into my um, repository now, we can see that it no longer shows up as something that has changed. So going forward, if I make changes to my analysis, um, I can see that those changes are tracked in the Git pane. And just like I did before, I can stage them, I can commit them, I can write a commit message, something informative, hopefully, um, and then I can go ahead and push those changes and those changes will be reflected on GitHub. So this can be how easy it is to get started with GitHub. And particularly if you are working on a project on your own, which I think is a good way to get started um, with GitHub, with a project that you're working on on your own to begin with, um, this might be all you need to know about GitHub to get started. Obviously, once you start collaborating on a project uh, with others, there may be other things that you want to pay attention to. 
like who is committing when, what happens if we're both committing at the same time. And we have things that we call our merge conflicts. How do we resolve them? But those are things that you can get to once you get a little bit of practice using version control by yourself. So if you're our user and you want to do use version control, I highly recommend the online book, Happy Git with R, um, that has basically everything you need to know for using Git um, in the context of doing data analysis with R. And all of the setup that I did that enabled me to you know, start using a Git repository and even create a GitHub repository from the one I had locally without me typing my password at any point is because I have stored my credentials in a particular way. And that's leveraging the use this package in R. Um, and it has a really nice vignette that allow, that shows you how to set everything up on your computer. So I recommend starting there, setting up your credentials properly, and then starting using um, version control with R. So number seven is automate your process. So what do I mean by that? We had all of this, uh, this folder with all of this, um, you know, analysis scripts and whatnot. And one thing I can do, um, you know, the cheapest way to perhaps um, automate your workflow is to say, I'm going to add a new um, uh, script here that just says analyze that R. And in that script, what I have is something that sources all of my other analyses. So I can simply run that one as opposed to all the other ones. This way, I don't need to worry about in which order to rerun my analysis. If your work is a bit more complex than that, though, there are two other options that I would recommend. One, if you already are familiar with the Make uh, tool, uh, which is really, really kind of powerful, but it has a bit of a learning curve, um, then I would recommend using that in the context of your work with R as well. And Carl Broman has a really nice um, kind of tutorial. It is old but make hasn't changed really over the years. Its functionality is the same, so it's still quite relevant. Um, the minimal make tutorial is where I would recommend. If you're not a make user and you're looking for a solution that's natively in R, the targets package uh, by Will Landau is a really nice package. Um, it is it has a learning curve as well. There's a lot of moving parts to it, but if you do kind of complicated uh, complex analysis in R where pieces um, of your analysis depends on other pieces and you don't wanna constantly be rerunning everything like even uh, like by reediting a single document, this is the sort of thing that I would recommend that you use. So invest your time in learning something like this, perhaps as opposed to just learning make, unless that technology is useful for you in other venues as well. And there's a really, really um, kind of uh, detailed um, documentation on it as well. And the last principle was sharing your computing environment. I left this to the last because it's one of the harder ones and I only have you know, some guidance to give here. Uh, but what I'm going to do is instead of getting into the details of the how-to, I'm going to leave some logos with you uh, and tell you just very briefly about how you might use them. So um, uh, kind of a golden standard perhaps in reproducibility is you containerize things. So when you talk to people, who like Docker, that's kind of all they can talk about. Create a Docker container, put your analysis in there, share your Docker container. And if you're familiar with that technology, that very well might be the solution that you are looking for. But at the same time, know that there is a learning curve there as well. There's another project called Binder, which allows you to add a computing environment to say your GitHub repository. So you can almost have push button reproducibility within your GitHub repository, where you enable Binder in there and it will um, open up kind of a container for you where you can run your analysis. Another approach, perhaps a little less complex, might work for simpler projects is to use something like RStudio Cloud or Google Colab, where that's where you do your analysis. Again, not on your local computer, but if this environment that you set, and the nice thing with these two options is that you don't have to know how to build a container yourself. You don't have to write a lot of config files, particularly with RStudio Cloud. You can just set it up as a project, install the packages, whatever versions you need. And when you're collaborating with somebody, um, instead of just sharing your code through GitHub, you can actually share your computational environment on our Studio Cloud as well. So next time they are computing, they're using the same version of R, the same version of uh, R, R packages, so on and so forth that you have set up for them. 
they tend to be really nice tools for teaching as well, because then your students are on the same page with you. So these were the eight principles we talked about. Organize your project, write readings liberally, keep data tidy and machine readable, comment your code, use literate programming, use version control, automate your process, and share your computing environment. Easier said than done, perhaps, but a, a takeaway for you here might be that think about where you are in the spectrum and see if you can simply move on to the next principle with the next project that you're working on. Um, a really nice paper that I strongly recommend you read on this um, uh, issue is Good Enough Practices in Scientific Computing uh, by Greg Wilson uh, et al. And um, there are two reasons why I like it. It's a short paper that is kind of, it's like 10 bullet points um, and it really tells you what to do. I think it's an easy read. And number two, it's good enough practices, not best practices. It acknowledges the fact that this stuff is hard and sometimes just being good enough can be a huge improvement from where you are. So once again, the slides you can find at bit.ly slash improve wrapper workflow. And I shared the link to the repository we created as well, which has the R markdown file we developed. So if you wanna dig into some of the code in there, you're welcome to do that. And I'd be happy to answer any questions in the time we have remaining.